Hi, my name is Wei Haoding. I grew up in Beijing, China. Then got my master's degree of electrical engineering at Boston University in the United States. After I graduated, like how many pharmaceutical developers joined this industry, I started working as a pharmaceutical developer by accident. But I immediately fell in love with this profession. After working in the states for a few years, I moved to Canada. Now I'm living in Toronto with my lovely wife and our two cats. As you can probably see from the background, I spend the majority of my leisure time playing video games, listening to music, as well as building plastic models of robots because I think they're really cool. I'm currently working for Direct Impact Solutions as their lead developer, business analyst, as well as project manager. Wearing multiple hats encouraged me to develop techniques that would align technical features with business processes. In today's session, I would like to share my experience on that with you. Workflow-based design is a way to organize your solution that goes beyond the basic list and form view. If you think about organizing features in your solution like packing for travel, the traditional list and form view, especially the form view, is like bringing everything you have, regardless of whether you need them at all times. On the contrary, a workflow-based design would select items to pack for the purpose of the trip. It's all about providing features in context and tailoring the experience to the user. The workflow-based design increases user productivity, provides more room for future expansion, and improves customer satisfaction. However, it does take longer to develop because it is structurally more complex. About a year ago, I was lucky enough to be brought into a project that adopted workflow-based design when the project was about halfway through. The system looks really nice. However, I do see some challenges that developers were facing. First of all, inevitably, the workflow-based design requires more features to be built to optimize the user experience. Many of these features, or sets of features, are needed in more than one place. At the time, many scripts were created to deliver these features from different contexts. These scripts are structurally intertwined, which makes them hard to maintain or update. Second, as the project progresses, the system's usability gets improved over time based on user feedback, which is what you should do. However, this means new features are requested as we go. Given the first problem, with all these existing features intertwined, it gets harder to predict the impact of new features. In return, testing becomes a struggle, and the quality of the system is threatened because of that. Third, not only do we have new features added to the system, but how they are combined are also frequently changed, which is normal because a lot of times, if you're doing a good job, the business stakeholders will come up with better workflow and processes after seeing or trying your new features. However, trying to keep up with this was not an easy feat especially giving the first two problems. So does this mean the workflow-based design is a hoax? Of course not. Our designer is trying her best to align her design with business process. However, as developers, our technical approach does not align well with business process, which generated those challenges. So now, it's a good time to take a look at this session's agenda.
To figure out how to align our technical approach with the business process, we need to understand the characteristics of business processes. First, I'd like to define the term process and workflow to align our terminology for the sake of communication. Second, I want to talk about what characteristics of processes generated those challenges and what do we need to overcome them. Third, I'd like to showcase a scripting technique that helped me overcome those challenges. Last but not least, I want to talk about the result we got, some usage considerations, and additional resources. So, without further ado, let's get into this. Process and workflow have many definitions. Here, I'm not trying to give them definitive meanings. I only want to align terminology for the sake of this session. Many of you probably have seen something like this before, whether as a workflow chart or a process map. Regardless of the name, it is a diagram representing a step-by-step -step approach to achieve a goal. So for this session, I'm going to call the whole thing a workflow. And I'm going to call each individual step a process. The first challenge I faced is about organizing features so they can be reused. It's common for the same process to be used in multiple workflows within an organization. In fact, process reuse is a key enabler for improving business efficiency because it encourages organizations to employ standardized best practices. So because processes can be reused, it will be helpful if the features we build to complete these processes can also be reused whenever possible. The second challenge I faced is organizing features so that each one can be easily expanded without much overhead. Within the same process, new tasks or requirements can be added or removed to optimize the process. For example, a validation task can be added to a process for quality control. Um, maybe the business wants the ability to roll back for a process that couldn't do it before. Maybe some information going through a process now need to be recorded for auditing purpose. Because processes can change it will be nice if we can add more features to an existing process without too much overhead. The third challenge I faced is organizing features so they can be rearranged and combined flexibly. As we all know, business evolves. To cope with changes introduced by that, workflows within an organization tend to go through many updates and optimization continually. Processes can be organized in different orders. New processes can be added to existing workflows. Uh, for example, say for the sales team in a company, originally they take a top-down approach by writing up the full scope of work first and then breaking it down into multiple projects to be carried out by production. Later, they realized they could never keep up with the amount of work coming their way, which of course is a good problem. However, they become bottlenecks for their value stream. So rather than writing the full scope first and then breaking it down into projects, they decided to define projects first and sending them to production as soon as possible. Then 
later in the workflow, they will aggregate them to generate a full scope. So as you can see in this example, the process to define the full scope and the process to define the project have switched places. So because processes can be reorganized, it will be nice if features that we build for them can be rearranged and combined in a flexible way to cope with these changes. Kind of like playing Lego. So how do we overcome these challenges? Before I dive into a technical solution, let's take a look at something we are all familiar with that solves very similar problems. A train. Imagine you own a road construction company that needs to travel to different cities to work. To help you transport all your equipment, you made a deal with the train company to get your own dedicated train loaded with all your stuff. For each train cabin, you can load it with the equipment needed to complete a specific type of task. So whenever you need to complete this task, this train can deliver everything you need to you for as many times as you need it. This is reusability. Think about the equipment loaded onto this train. They are not part of the train. You can load them, unload them, however you want without having to tear down or enlarge or do anything about the train itself. This is expandability. And of course, train cabins can be rearranged and linked together in many orders. Equipment can be delivered to you in the order that makes sense for the task to be completed. And this is flexibility. So now, let's talk about how do we build something similar to a train in FileMaker. First, let's build a cabin. A train cabin holds all the equipment needed to complete a task. Similarly, this virtual cabin we're building should be able to wrap around all features required to complete the process. So it can deliver all those features to us when we need them. We can implement such a virtual cabin using a FileMaker script. From a high level, this script will take us to a certain layout and record or records. Then on this layout, we can access fields, buttons, portals, and everything we need to complete the process. Once we're done with the current process, this script will also exit. Whenever we need to complete such a process, we call this script. So this script is like a handle that we can add to our process to make it more tangible in the system. I call this type of a script a process script. So does the session title make sense now? I am sorry about the bad pun. Let's look at an example. I prepared a demo file that contains three processes. The first one is a process to add or edit an employee. Very simple. The second one is a process to add or edit a project. And the third one is a process to assign employees to a project as a project assignee.
To provide features needed to complete these three processes, I have developed three process scripts. So when open up the script workspace, you can see these three are the process scripts corresponding to those three processes. Structurally, they're very similar. So let's take a look at the one for project for now. Whenever a process needs to be invoked, I need to call the corresponding process script. For example, here, to edit the project, I call the process script for add added project and give it the uh, project ID of the current record. To make sure this script can be called from anywhere in the system, this script will have to be independent of the calling layout and record. So first thing first, this script will open up a new card window and navigate to the target layout. This way, we can go to the target layout without having to touch the current layout or record. And to make sure we land on the correct project record, the primary key of the project is passed in as a script parameter. This means when I call this script, it doesn't matter where I am. As long as I give it the right project ID, it will open up the card window, navigate to the project edit layout, and find me the target project for me to edit. So as I showed just then, on the project main, I pass the current project's project ID to this script. On the employee main screen, however, we have a portal that shows all the projects that the current employee is part of. So let's say if I want to added a project from here, what I can do is to call the same script, which is add edit project, and then pass the target project ID so this is the same TO that uh, this is the same table occurrence that my portal is using. When I pass it the right ID, it should take me to the right project for editing. For example, here I have two projects for this employee. If I want to go to project me, when I click on this newly added button now, it will take me to um, the project me. I can modify the information here, save it, and that will bring me back to my original layout and record. As we said earlier, equipment is not part of a train. By that logic, the process script should not interfere with features needed to complete the process. How do we do that? When the process script takes us to the target layout and target record, we pause the process script. This way, the user can use whatever features they need to complete the process without the interference of the process script. A great thing about this is that when we develop new features, we don't have to worry about the process script. For example, when we assign an employee to a project as a signee, right now, 
This script allows the same employee to be assigned multiple times, like this. So let's add a few script steps to prevent that from happening. Okay, so in here, I'm going to add another validation to make sure existing assignee cannot be assigned again. All right. And the way that we can tell that is to um, check if the employee ID that we want to add already exists on one of the assignees for the current project. So let's do this. So here's a list of employee IDs that belong to the current project. And then I want to make sure I don't have any matching employee IDs in that list. So if this is greater than zero, I'm going to give out a error message saying this employee has been assigned to the project. And um, while the script prevent the actual assigning from happening, why don't we add a little bit more visual indication so it's clear to the user that they really shouldn't be clicking on those existing um, assignees. So what we can do here is to add a conditional formatting to the button. For example, um, very similar logic what we'll do here is if the current employee ID can be found from the assignee's employee ID list, then uh, we will change the um, just light blue, we'll change the fill color of the button. Okay, let's try this out. So if I do this, you can see these three assignees have already been assigned. So their corresponding employee record are highlighted. And if I want to click on one of them, I get the error message. And as you can see, during the whole process of me doing that, updating the script, updating the layout, I didn't have to check the process script once because I'm certain doing those kind of changes would not interfere with the process script. So before I move on, I want to talk about the benefit of pausing. The first benefit of pausing the process script rather than just exiting is that the process script is still running, which means it can react to things happening if we want it to. I will elaborate on this when we start talking about building the link. Also, the script gets called when the process starts and the script exit with the process ends. This means the scope of the script aligns with the scope of the process it, of the process it is supporting. This brings us the second benefit of the pausing. By pausing the process script, it allows us developers to leverage the script stack and use local variables rather than global variables to store information needed for a particular process. For example, here, I'm using the same script for adding a project versus editing a project. 
when I click add, this label will say add project. If I click edit, it will say edit. This is achieved by having a local variable here without a post process script you would have to manage a global variable here to display the right word. And once the process is done, you will have to clean it up to make sure it can be reused in the future. With a local variable, the variable lives and dies within the scope of the script, so we don't have to manage it. FileMaker will automatically take care of it for us. So by passing the process script, we wrap the process script around the process itself to make sure it doesn't interfere with features inside, but aligns really well with it. Assuming now the user has finished what he wants to do for the current process and is ready to move on. He might want to save his changes or he doesn't like what he did and would like to cancel and roll back. And perhaps he wants to go to a different layout or a different record to work on those next. Any of these actions will terminate the current process. And this is when we resume the process script to handle the termination of the current process. Let's take a look at how this is done. We are on the project assignee layout and pay close attention to the button options here. For a button like this that does not terminate the current process, the button option is set to pause current script. This will make sure clicking on this button will not interfere with the process script. However, for the save, cancel, and the add employee button, their options are all set to resume current script. This would resume the paused process script so that it can start taking actions to terminate the current process. Let's take a look at the uh, process script for uh, project assignee and see how the uh, save or cancel action are being handled. So when you click on one of these, um, it calls a script to pass a parameter. Because the process script is paused, once it's resumed, the uh, get the script result function here would grab the um, parameter that you set on the button. So this is how the process script can tell which kind of action the user wants to take to terminate the current process. If the user wants to save, then it will call the subscript to commit change and close the car window. If the user wants to cancel, it will um, call this script to revert the change and then close the car window. Once those actions are done, it will send a signal to the process script letting it know that the user is done with everything, the process should end now, um, that will exit out of this loop and land the user here. If all the user wants to do is to save or cancel and be done with it, then after they land here, there's nothing much else happening before they exit the script. So for example, if they simply click on this button to call up the assignee card and wants to add and remove some assignee here and click save, then this is how it's done. Um, this is how the process script for the assignee is being used for a single process workflow like this. But what if the user wants to start a second process? For example, after adding a employee, 
the user might wants to may want to add a project from there. Well, I don't actually have this developed. So let's see how these two processes can be linked together. So the first process is the uh, employee process. So let's open up the uh, employee card window layout. Right now, um, we only have two buttons here, the save and cancel. And um, let's say there is a, a third one here called um, add project. And um, we will add it here. Let's uh, make some room for it. It's definitely not the the prettiest way to add this button, but uh, just for the sake of uh, of the demo. So make sure we want to make sure that the button action is set to resume, and we want to make sure the parameter is something different from save or cancel because this is a different type of action. So here, let's just name it add project as the uh, parameter. From here, let's go to the uh, process script for employee. Right now, you can tell there are only two types of actions that are being handled to terminate the process. One is save, the other one is cancel. So let's add another one. And uh, the parameter we put in there is add project. So here uh, we'll make the condition to be if the user action is equal to add project. Um, let's update our comment for readability. Okay, so from here, when you add a project, you definitely want to save your progress on your employee card. So let's just copy what happens here. You want to save it, and if it's saved successfully, the process and uh, variable will be set to one. So if it wants to end this process. Now let's call the next process. So the next process would be adding a project. So we can simply call the process script to add or edit a project here. Because I'm adding a project, I don't need to specify any script parameters. So like that. And then um, to make sure that um, it doesn't, this flow doesn't get stuck in a loop, we will add a uh, exit script here. Let's try that out. So let's go to the employee main, try to uh, add it, the employee information. And then um, instead of saving, I want to go add a project. So I just click on that. It will take me to the project car window to start the project adding process. And then let's say this is uh, um, project agogo. Specify those information, uh, $50 for it, and then save. Okay, so if I take a look at here, the project has been added, which means the change we made successfully chained two processes together, as described in this uh, process chart. So two processes, after the second process is done, it does not go back. But what if we want to go back? For example, when we are adding, when we're adding a signee, sometimes we might realize the person we're trying to add is not added as an employee yet. So from there, we would like to go add an employee first. And then once we're done with that, it would be nice if we can go back to the uh, editing assignee process so we can select the person we just added 
and so that we can finish the first process that we started. Okay, so this is again a two process workflow. However, after the second process is done, it goes back to the first process. This, I actually already have it developed. So let's see, from here, I'm trying to edit some assign as some uh, assignee. I put two people in there, and then I realize the third person I want to add is not in this list yet. So when I click on the add assignee button, it takes me to the assignee card. Uh, let's say the uh, the next person I want to add is myself. Okay, do that. Going back to the assignee process. And from here, I can select myself and be done with that. So how is that achieved? Well, let's take a look at the uh, calling process first. So the first process is edit assignee. So let's look at that first. From here, when the user click on the um, add assignee button, it will resume the process script and take the user inside this branch. From here, it will, it's very similar to the, um, the change that we just made to link the pro, add project process with the add uh, employee process. It will save your changes first because we don't want to lose those changes. And if the changes were saved successfully, it will call the uh, process script to add an employee. The thing that is a little bit different here is that it actually specified script parameters for callback script name and the callback script parameter. The callback script name is simply my current script. So I use get script name function here to grab the uh, to dynamically grab the uh, script name that is running the script parameter then um, is just a script parameter of my current script so because I do I capture this script parameter at the beginning of my process script right over here I can simply pass it as the callback script parameter okay now let's look at the employee uh, employee process script which is the second process script. Remember, if, if the user click on save or cancel, they get taken, after all those actions have been handled, they get taken here. And from here, if we do have a callback script name being specified, then it will utilize the ability to perform a script by a calculated name, which is this variable, to uh, invoke the first process again. With techniques shown above, we can chain any process scripts together uh, in however, however order we want it. Let's look at one more example that really mix it up. So here I'm showing a workflow that contains three processes all chained together. We started by adding a project and then we start editing its assignee. Uh, halfway in between, we realized the uh, assignee we're trying to assign is not in the employee list yet. So we go add it. Once we're done with that, we go back to adding more assignee and then um, we go back to fill out the rest of the project. Okay. Okay, let's try that. Say so product blue, start date, end date. Don't know the uh, budget yet. Going to assignee. I myself in here. Realize I don't have um, the designer I want. So, Um, can add Alexis here. Gonna save it. Okay. Select her. 
save again, go back to project, and save. Part of blue. And that's just the happy path. You can mix it up, uh, for example, uh, while you are um, adding your assignee, do that, and then you want to add one more employee, but you can't remember the name, so you cancel it out. Going back here, and then from here, you save. Uh, now you remember, okay, and then from here you specify the budget, and now you remember what the new person is called, uh, and realize they're actually already in here. You do that. See, you can just mix and match in uh, however flow that makes sense to you to extend the chain of processes for as long as you want it. Here are some additional resources for you. The first one is the demo file I used. As mentioned before, all three process scripts included in this demo file are very similar structurally. So in addition to those three, I also added a process script template that can be duplicated to create new process scripts within minutes. If you'd like to know more about workflow-based design, check out this session from Alexis at Hyperdata Solutions talking about workflow-based design from the designer's perspective. In the demo, each process script forms one data transaction, meaning you either have to commit or revert to changes before terminating the process. If you chain multiple processes together and want to have all changes made on those processes to form one large data transaction, check out this session from Vince at Beeswax talking about the local file technique. Some of you might have noticed my scripts always have a loop in it. This is called the single pass loop technique. I use it to reduce redundancy in my error handling code to enhance readability. Check out this article from Brent at Saliant to learn more.